Hey, all you cinema drunks, this is Ben, and welcome to House of the Dragon, Binge Drinking, the podcast. And today on Binge Drinking, we're joined by none other than Johnny Diamond. hi -o. Hey, man. Good to see you. He's gone under many names. He's been on the show before, but that's his name tonight, and we'll leave it at that. You know, when I, uh, when you and I started talking about this show, we started to realize that we both were fucking really in love with this show. At least I think I, oh, yeah. I'll preface this real quick. I've never seen, I think I've seen some of the first season, uh, like 10 years ago of, uh, of, uh, um, Game of Thrones, but I don't know anything because I don't remember anything except like lots of death and weird sex stuff and incest. But other than that, I don't remember anything about the lore or the story. So I'm, I'm going, I was going into House of the Dragon completely blind, which was fucking fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. I know that you're a House of, uh, or you're a Game of Thrones fan. Uh, what did you think about Game of Thrones as a whole? Because I know that a lot of people detracted from it as it as it kind of closed out its series as being kind of shitty but i've only heard that i've never seen so what what is your what how are you left with uh, game of thrones i still think the original game of thrones up until now was probably the best thing on tv maybe ever in my opinion um the ending was really bad especially for game of thrones i would say it was on par with most other <laughs> shows but to be honest it was really just like maybe a couple of scenes in the last episode or two that just really felt forced and and it was at a time when the show writers the writing i think had gone beyond the books and you could just see that other writers just don't have what it takes to write these you know jr martin is is uh you know really 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 good storyteller and when the show writers were left without his input i feel like it just kind of fell apart it felt like they just sort of phoned it in for a couple of scenes but they stand out because game of thrones was from the beginning to the end so solid i mean writing casting acting obviously sets cgi special effects just best thing on tv and it's funny because hbo keeps bringing it like i never watched sopranos I never watched Boardwalk Empire, but oh, you know, they're both so all. good. They're both so good. Exactly right, and so every, all my friends loved both of those, and they were like, "This is the best show on TV." And then when Game of Thrones came out, they're like, "This is the new best show on TV," you know. <laughs> and uh, so I even I, liked I a couple of that. seasons of uh, True Blood before. I think that kind of went off the rails, but if the first few did. True Blood were really good too. I was really into True Blood as well. Yeah, it got a little campy, but you know, whatever. So, Those so uh, pig, piggybacking on what you said about Game of Thrones, real quick, um, cause, because again, I didn't watch it, but I, I listened to the trades all the time, and one of the things, unfairly or fairly, uh, were kind of cast upon the show runners was that they were hacks because, it's, like you said, as soon as the source material ran out, they didn't know what to do. And there was also this rumor that they were getting courted to do their own Star Wars, uh, something, oh. Star Wars project. So they kind of lost interest in Game of Thrones and just rushed it in the end. I, I'm saying all this as someone that just hearsay, because again, I didn't see how it all unfolded. I don't know what happened. So it's kind of nice that like the showrunners of this show are working with George R. R. Martin. And, and these books are completed to my knowledge. Yeah. So it makes a little bit more sense, but, uh, Let's get into House of the Dragon because my God, like I've just never seen anything on television in my life that can span the time that this show does. I mean, we'll get into lots of aspects of the show, but the thing that impresses me the most is the is the time, the time that goes by and how you're never confused or lost, even with like multiple like casting changes, understandably so, because you know, there's kids, people get older. And then some of them stay the same, which is kind of funny, I guess. Like Matt Smith's, you know, Prince <laughs> Dam Damon Targaryen Damon. doesn't seem to age in 30 years. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Damon the ageless. <laughs> but you can't recast Matt Smith because he's so fucking great so in this good. show. But yeah, that's that's one of the things that really, I think it's magnificent the way they've they managed to do those time jumps and still keep me enter and still keep me engaged and knowing what's going on and wanting to know where it goes. Like I just... I haven't felt this way about a TV show in a lot. I mean, I love 
funny shows and sci-fi shows, but this one just had like my emotional core wrapped up in knots. The characters are all so relatable, even though we're not warlords in some Renaissance time Speak or you yourself. know whatever. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, speaking of the, the, the time jumps, it really is a challenge. And, and because they've got such great writing and dialogue, and this is something that, you know, we, you and I mentioned before, uh, their dialogue isn't just delivered through words of, you know, they're spoken. I mean, they deliver dialogue through expressions. Like there's whole scenes where there's a conversation between characters where they don't say anything. It's just all in the eyes, you know, and, and you get it from a context of what's happening around them. And because they're so good, the, the Game of Thrones, you know, crafts people are so good at the stages and, and you know, the, the writing and the delivery of the dialogue and the casting and stuff, they can cue you that this is the same character that you saw before played by someone else. Like, for example, when the two main protagonists, you know, um, Rhaenyra and um, Allison, you know, at the beginning, they're played by teenagers. And then suddenly you fast forward and it's a few years later and they're probably played by, you know, young ladies in their 20s or something like that. But, you know, it's a 10, you know, 10 year gap. But because, for example, with Allison, I believe while she was still played by the younger actress, she walked out in her green dress and they made a point of people in the crowd saying those are the war colors of her house. Yeah. And then when they fast forward to a different actress playing the same character, she's still in green. You know, she still that has was, that uh, hair. Emily Carey, who played the young version of Queen Allison, that was her. So good. That was her final episode when she came out in the black at the wedding. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. In the green at the mm -hmm. wedding, and then Olivia Cook, who is one of my favorite young actresses, who plays her as the older version. She's about 29, about to be 30. So yeah, you're right mm -hmm. on the money with that. But those two, to me physically look more alike they than do. uh millie alcott who played the young uh rhaenyra versus uh, uh emma darcy who they just don't look anything alike but it doesn't matter because you immediately just fall right back into the character but yeah uh, it really is hard to match up older and younger especially if they're not in the same family you know actors and actresses it, it just it's really difficult but you know something that they do of matching them up, which is kind of fun, which like uh, once you watch more of the original Game of Thrones, you'll kind of get more kick out of all the references that they just subtly make, you know, um, like, for example, when they mention uh, the Lannister family, you know, there's a couple of scenes here and there in the new show, House of the Dragon, where there's, uh, you know, uh, the main Lannister character and you get a little feel for his personality. And it's so interesting that you can see the family resemblance between this, you know, the air quote family resemblance between the actor who plays Lannisters 100 and almost 200 years earlier and the actors that they had played the Lannisters, the is main, that, pro, you know, is that right? family. So the guy, that played, the guy that played Sir Tylen Lannister in this, because he's like, he's a stoic, good looking. I'm thinking of Jamie Lannister, Jamie Lannister, the hand, you know, that uh, and uh, no, Jamie but, Lannister. But, 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 but the, guy in, the guy in this show was Tylen oh. Lannister. He's the guy oh, okay. that was trying, to, he was trying to court Rhaenyra when they were teenagers. Exactly. Big brooding, he's sort of like, like looking dude. Yeah, he's sort of like a cocky fuck, you know, with uh, yeah. with that blonde hair and stuff. And and then, you know, Jamie Lannister, cocky fuck with blonde hair, you know. And, so, <laughs> and the same thing with, like, the the other families. You you just sort of see the, the traits, you know. So they really do a good job. I mean, HBO casts so well. And, and they're like, okay, this is a person from the Stark family. These are the attributes that we're looking for. Facial features, hair color, just sort of the way the mannerisms, you know, just those things like that. They're subtle. And a lot of it, I could just be just putting things together that, you know, are just coincidental. But it just, as a whole, comes across so well. It's just so believable that these are members of similar families, the same families, uh, you know, span across generations, you know, like especially the similarities between Rhaenyra and, um, you know, in the earlier Game of Thrones, yes. uh, with Daenerys. She does really kind of resemble, like, like Rhaenyra a little bit, yeah. She really does. And the other thing that's so fun, and I'll, I'll you know, leave it at that, but just even in the costuming between the two different series, because you'll notice that, like, for example, the hairstyles of the, uh, the, the women um, in the Valerian house, um, I'm not going to say her name right, but Rhaenys, uh, not Rhaenyra, the younger one, but Rhaenys, the queen who never was, 
you'll notice that rainies, she has her rainies. rain. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. But you'll notice that her hair is done in these braids that from the front go back up like dragon um, horns. And that's the hairstyle that the that you see Daenerys, you know, Targaryen later on uh, as the dragon riders, the women do their hair to sort of look like the 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 spikes of the dragon on the top of the dragon's head, you know, and yeah, so it's just sense. those. Yeah, just those similarities in costume really tie together that these are similar families. These are similar people, even across the different series. I just love that attention to detail. That's what makes HBO the best. How much cooler is this for you than me that you you I mean, the way that you talk about um, Game of Thrones, like, you know, it by I and I remember like how much you would talk about it and stuff like that. And now you're you're getting to see sort of like the myth, like almost like you're finally getting to see the prequels of Star Wars, yet they just handled that exactly. all wrong. You know, oh, yeah. or is this like you you get to see these houses where everyone has a dragon and how you actually have to get your dragon and mm -hmm. what you have to show the dragon. And like for me, again, just this, I, I don't have anything else to go on, but for you, it must be so interesting to see like, wow, I've always wanted to see the, the stuff that we heard about in Game of Thrones, but now we're actually seeing Absolutely. it. And having it fucking pay off instead of being so ridiculous and convoluted and and stupid. Everyone just has their own dragon. And it's just a common thing, you know? <laughs> like, it is so cool. It's so cool. You know, because this is uh they're talking about, you know, this time in the in the Game of Thrones, they talk about the times of the House of the Dragon and many other times, you know, which I would love to see explored. But in the time of Game of Thrones, dragons started out as a thing of the past like dinosaurs their skulls were still like there jedi. we know yeah. that like, like jedi yeah. like something that yeah. we knew about a long time ago yeah exactly and yet there then dragon eggs pop up and that you know that they're hatched and they slowly grow but this is over a span of seasons and like even in one season they just lock the dragons in a dungeon and just leave it at that and also the people who made the show I think that they were just really afraid of visualizing these creatures in a way that didn't look convincing because you know, Star Wars, there's a lot of bad CGI out there, right? And so <laughs> it took them years just to develop the ability to make these. And I love it because they go back to Jurassic Park. They build props. They have props of these animals like, you know, the uh, the, the dragon head. Could yeah, they have full scale so can... arms and full scale legs and heads. Exactly. And then, and so there's something to base the CGI off of. And the way that they flesh them out, they're like lizards or bats. They're basically like flying lizards. They're like the manners of the way they move around are like yeah. bats. But they're, li they're so like the point, bats. Yeah. They are. And, and, and even um, more so, like, I guess in the first uh, series, they'll show the dragons walking along the ground sometimes, just like bats, you know? And you'll notice the claws are at the top of the wing. And so that's, you know, the wings are just, anyway. So, um, it took forever for them to actually get a full grown dragon wrecking shop. And it's really only a few seasons, like a few scenes in the last couple of seasons, you know, where you really get some dragon action. And, and that's what everyone was waiting for. There was a South Park episode where the kids, they're just so fed up with, there's no dragons. They go to J.R. Martin's place and he just, and he's just the master of the tease. They'll tease you and then they'll tell you a different story. And then it's like, no, the dragons. And they'll tease you and they'll but, tell you a different story. But dragons not in the name of Game of Thrones. It exactly. is exactly House it of the is. Dragons. So and they this start show is the not gonna be able with to it. this show is not gonna be able to get away with not showing a lot of dragons. Exactly. It did not disappoint. And I have to say, I've seen so many movies with dragons. Dragons <laughs> I've never seen more realized dragons ever like you said hbo they just spend the money man they may they don't half ass their shit because if these if these dragons in this show looked even halfway shitty they would never hear the end of it and it wouldn't be as successful as it is the fact that you never think about the fact that they're not there that a per that a kid is not climbing onto one of these things <laughs> that that's all you need to do you don't need to showcase them i mean they do showcase them in, in some great scenes but i love how they're always in the background a lot too and they're always just kind of standing over their castle or whatever and watching exactly. their rider that's the best way to do it it had some you know uh location shoots and stuff and you can tell but it also had to use um you know that thing that they do now i can't remember what it's called but they have this like rotating room of cgi 
So they had to use some of that, but it's so sparingly used that I never once got taken out by the way a dragon looked, especially, you know, God damn. I mean, we'll get into the final, like, you know, dragon scene, but fuck, <laughs> fuck me, man. Like those things look so fucking cool, dude. Like, holy. Oh, man. But like in and, and each dragon, I don't know if it was like this in Game of Thrones, but they have so much personality to like, I mean, they have personality in the sense, I don't want to exaggerate their personality. They have personality in the sense that they, they, you know, they show fear, they show anger, they show, uh, um, um, uh, they, they protect, you know, they show, they show those kind of traits. I'm not saying like, there's a funny yeah, dragon. Absolutely. There's a, there's yeah, a, no, it's not like that. No. no, it's not like that. It's just like, they, they have traits about them that make them feel alive. And that's the thing I love about this show is like, Every frame and every character and every CGI render just feels alive. You know, like it is alive. They started the beginning of the first episode of the House of the Dragons um, with Rhaenyra flying her dragon. You know, and for someone who's been waiting however many years at Game of Thrones, but six years, whatever. Yeah. You know, right off the bat, they just yeah, <laughs> right off the bat. I, I like, feel Here's super your dragon. I feel super spoiled because I started. You are. <laughs> yeah. So I get all I get all the dragons now. So if I watch Game of Thrones, well, I know what I'm I know what I'm in for now. But I'll be like, man, it was so much more cool. And there's you know. Oh, dude, and ending with I mean, we're doing spoilers here, right? Oh fuck yeah, yeah. Spoiler, oh, yeah, spoilers turn through, yeah. Dude, the largest dragon on earth, just chomping this like little average size dragon oh, how great there. was that that person on oh. twitter i think i sent you that twitter clip where it's like what oh, yeah what how it should have ended and it's like as soon as <laughs> eight, what, what was that uh lucas or know, luke yeah, he just like yeah. lands his dragon he sees the what's the giant dragon's name the fucking biggest i don't dragon. know yeah but he just he like he just, and then he just, that is. somebody just like took the footage and reversed it so he just gets <laughs> on, on his dragon and flies away. <laughs> flies away he should have just flown away i mean especially given all the family feud between him and his cousins you know yeah, he was trying and, not to uh he was trying not to disappoint his mom you know like exactly and that's the thing you know we'll get into that but like rhaenyra is just as guilty as the dragon and Aegon, the brother that looks like a Pirates of the Caribbean guy. <laughs> but um, because she sent him out there and she had to have known something could go bad, you know? Exactly. And and it's just, you know, that's true. They took that risk. And it was, I think it was just sort of the kids showing, look, we're growing up. We can help out with the family stuff. You know, we do have dragons. And yet they just didn't know that there was going to be a bigger, hungrier dragon. I think the kids, a lot of people were complaining that the last episode wasn't epic epic enough and i think see i don't care i don't care about epicness like i i love the fact that i think the next season is going to be so much more based on the kids that it I made more sense to set up their their situation and stuff like that it just to me it just made a little bit more sense but you know t real quick um because you were you were talking about um the acting and how just actions just the actions and the look speak so much more than anything else to me when i was watching this show almost every episode had at least two or three of these scenes where it's the cinematographer knowing how to frame up characters that are pivotal to the scene the actors just crushing every second of their scene through their eyes through their facial expressions through their head turns and tilts and then also, obviously, the writing and the directing. But though, so many scenes of just people at a table. The tension was so fucking high. You know, like, <laughs> give me that over, like, just a battlefield any day of the week. And I'm sure, I know those are cool, and I'm sure they're coming next season for sure. Yeah. But 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 I do feel next season will have a little bit, it'll probably be a lot of dragons battling dragons as opposed to just ground stuff because you have all these dragons, right? Like, whereas in mm -hmm. Game of Thrones, so. you didn't, so... It's it, a lot of people describe the dragons in Game of Thrones like a nuclear bomb. Like if you have one, you have the keys to like destroy anything, you know? Yeah. This, but and it's so show, interesting everyone has one. So, you know, that's true. And, and so, you know, think of them as a stealth fighter or like you said, a nuclear bomb, you know, some airborne, you know, power when no one else has any air power, you know? Yeah. And especially in the one battle episode, I think it was maybe the third or so, where um, uh, Damon and um, Corliss and them, they're all up to take out the 
crab feeder, you know, because they don't want the free cities to take the claim of getting rid of the pirates. And they have that battle, but yet it really wasn't like a large pitched battle. Like, I love the opening scene of, of when they get to that, uh, the narrow sea or whatever the pass is. Um, and you see, you hear how small the numbers are. Yeah. You know, we've got like 16 to 18 ships, 2000, you know, a couple hundred men, 60 knights. And this is like, this is it. That's all they've got. And, and they get a word from the king that he's sending twice as many ships with 2000 men. And for some reason that just pisses Damon off, you know, he starts beating the messenger and then they, yeah. and he goes and offers himself as bait to get the crab out of his cave, you know, and, and then they do have a pitched battle, you know, they, but it's not like a set piece thing where you got the armies lining up at the no. or something. Well, there's it's, just, you know, like with everything with this show, there's just a little line of dialogue where mm -hmm. where Damon finds out like the reason that the these crab fighters I can't remember their names you probably know like the, uh, they were a, their their leader was the uh, the crab feeder yeah uh, because he would nail people to the shipwrecks and let the crabs eat them so the reason <laughs> the reason that they can't be defeated is because of the way they hide in their caves and the and exactly. the dragons don't get to them even though to me i would feel like a dragon could just blow fire into the cave but nonetheless yeah. like that's kind of their strategy is they hide in these caves and then they flank so mm -hmm. there's just a little tiny tiny piece of dialogue of that and then damon knows exactly what to do even if at the time i didn't know what he was doing he waves a white flag and he yeah. gets them all out of their caves and then they all just get barbecued, you know? <laughs> so. and, and, you know, and the great thing is that you have to watch these episodes twice. Yeah, you, I, and you I, just have to pay have attention. To. You can't be on your cell phone during this show. You just no. can't. There's way, no, almost, because, every, almost every piece of dialogue written on paper is important to what's going on. Absolutely. And, and important to what's going on, maybe two episodes, two episodes on mine. Um, because, for example, that part right there, when I watched it the first time, I didn't get what was going on. I just see Damon offering the white flag and then, you know, this and that. But then when I'm, I watched I'm with it again, you. I'm with you. I had to watch yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. The second time, then as they're coming in, there's an argument about which knight is fool enough to offer himself his face. And then Damon comes in. <laughs> like, is it because Damon this is. This guy he, just got here. He, I, I, maybe you could tell me who his heir is in Game of Thrones, but Damon to me is like the ultimate badass tv character i've seen in so long and i never would have thought matt smith you know like doctor who and all that stuff i never thought he could convince me on how fucking gnarly he is but his character to me i know a lot of people love venerys and i do too and i also love otto um but god damn like damon just he keeps he keeps surprising you with every episode. You don't know what his headspace is. Like he's, is he, he, I mean, obviously he's a bad guy, but he also does all these great things. You know, like the scene we'll talk about in the, in the throne room where Venerys is trying to walk to the thing and drops the crown, oh, yeah. the crown. And it's like, I just, I think, I think Damon Targaryen is just a fucking unbelievable character. So who is he? Do you know who he is? Uh, to he's a Targaryen, like, so he's, yeah, you know, um, the whole thing is that I thought, because I don't know the books or anything, and I don't really pay attention to the previous stuff, no, so from the way the they show, opened the it, show, just the show, yeah, yeah, just from the show, I thought this was going to be a civil war between uncle and niece, between Damon and Rhaenyra, I thought that that's that how it was going to That ain't happening. <laughs> that ain't happening at all, yeah, then I watched the YouTube video, and they were like, no, actually, it's... He marries his niece and they go and fight her brother, you know, and so and then again, I assumed it was the oldest brother, you know, and uh, and so it's just like, who's, you know, who's on whose side and someone described Damon. He's in my mind. He's kind of like a Joker guy, like someone described him is the dude who just loves watching stuff happen. Yeah, you but, know, he's, but he's, he's more the instigator, that, but he's he more, more than that. that. He, he, he actually has empathy and he has feelings he like, develops. He is more he than I, I think the Joker thing is good. If you've watched the first three episodes, exactly he progresses in the show. He's so he much really does. And the fact that he, you know, did marry his niece and like now the war is going to be between, you know, God, like two best, two childhood best friends, which is Allison 
And the whole thing, I, I, I got to give some huge credit, and I want to ask you if the high towers actually have anything to do with Game of Thrones, but one of the best actors understated uh, in House of the Dragon, um, and I heard this out of another Welshman's mouth when I asked how to pronounce this name, <laughs> but his name is Reese Ephons. So that's how you actually say his name, Reese Ephons, and he plays Otto Hightower. And I've seen him in a million things when he was younger, but he is just the instigator of everything going on in this show. Every You're right about that thing. so far, strategy and plot, which is Getting the true. daughter at a young age to to marry Viserys, like oh, the king? everything. Oh, yeah. And just everything. even making her feel guilty if, she, if she's like sides with Rhaenyra or the kid. Like, God, he's so... I, and I get it, like you can it's hard to even call anyone evil on the show because they're all just looking after themselves and their families like basically any of these people that are in contention for the throne if they don't get it they're going to die you know yeah. and they say that repeatedly on the show well you know if you don't get the throne they're going to kill you and your family because they don't want you to come try to seek it out and that's just a horrible thing to think about yeah. it is it is and and you know, uh, Otto is, a, he's a strategist. He's a Machiavellian. He's the closest to Machiavelli we see here. Wow, and well said, 100%. Well said. Yeah. yeah. Damon, on the other hand, I think he's in his element when, um, remember one of the first episodes where he uh, gets the city watch and he transforms them into the gold cloaks. And he goes out and just rounds up. That was the first episode. These, that was yeah. the that was the first uh, time you see him. He's just fucking destroying all these people. He's destroying <laughs> all these unarmed people, you know, in the middle of town. <laughs> but why to make a point, you know? And then how does he celebrate when his when his brother's you know stillborn child you know, solidifies his you know thinks he solidifies his secession? He takes his whole crew down to the brothel and is celebrating, you know, like. He's in his element where he's instigating stuff. And going back to one of the most dramatic scenes where Viserys is he's insisting uh, his body is decaying and dying. And he's like, I will walk up to and sit on my throne. And then one of the Valerian, the younger brother, he starts making a claim and this and that. And Damon says, they cut to Damon and Damon and he says out loud, he goes, say it. Because, and he's got this huge grin on his face. And then the guy's like, so-and-so should be the you know king or whatever, you know? And like Damon just immediately chops his head off, like the top of his head off. Oh my you know, God, that was, that was, uh, that was Cordus you know? Valerian's brother, I think, right? Exactly, that's his brother, that yeah. I had some fucking cojones, dude, for walking <laughs> in that throne room and talking all that shit on everyone. He did. And Damon and I, was they the don't even let him like, say it sentence, because, because yeah, yeah, because Damon, Damon is like, I would love to kill you right now. That would be so much fun to just kill someone right now, you know? And there's so many times in scenes when you just watch Damon in scenes, more so in the beginning. He's just watching people. He's got this look on his face. Even when he doesn't do anything, he's just like, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? You know, I've got he's, a million of ADHD he's never kids not, in my He's class. never not scheming. He, the only yeah. time he's not scheming is when it does that that huge time jump between five and six and he's married the valerian daughter who was just gorgeous by the way mm -hmm. uh, i, I mm -hmm. can't remember her name but and her death scene with the, the oh, dragon, so tragic it was so sad oh. but and i just that noise that they gave the dragon just like i don't want to do this like exactly. that was when i said like dragons have personality that dragon just did not want to do that it was such a sad scene but that was kind of the one episode where damon wasn't strategizing he had a family because it did that huge time jump yep. and he loved her and he loved his yeah, kids. He was mature he was being a father yeah yeah and and then after all that happens obviously and then when more shit hits the fan he realizes he has to marry Renera, which is weird it for is. us but i guess in the game of throne world it's not that it's not that uh that crazy well, in that family <laughs> in that family it's something that family has done but it is still from you know, everyone else is like just as best you know but he he does that and you know the thing the thing that i would like to say about damon a lot of other characters, as they age, they switch out the actors and actresses, and they and they're trying to make the actors and actresses personalities and expressions, and you know as similar as possible to each other, you know, so that you could understand he's the same character. However, with Damon, they do the opposite. It's almost like the personality of younger Damon 
is that reckless, just happy-go-lucky destroyer who's like, I'll burn the house down because it's hilarious. And then you see him mature. You see him, you know, marry for real this time and actually raise his own children. And I love that uh, what you're, that episode you're talking about where you see him teaching his daughter Valerian. You know, this is the dead language that's useful to no one unless you have a dragon. You know, <laughs> so, you know, he's trying well, to train and the next at that moment he was he was teaching her because she was actually supposed to be the rightful writer of the, true. the biggest dragon but but i guess yeah, her mother's but i guess aegon though had a point though when he took it he's like you should have taken it when you had the chance taken it. And, yeah. I, and i actually <laughs> don't i actually don't fault aegon for taking the dragon because it's like you know what that kid had fucking balls of steel that that oh scene God. where he gets on that thing and manages <laughs> to stay on it he earned that dragon <laughs> for sure. yeah. and, and, and it's great because you see how this conflict comes from kids bullying each other yeah you know? yeah remember oh. it came from Aegon being bullied with the pig and stuff yeah with the pig and, and and all that stuff and and he's even in that episode where he's bullied with the pig dressed up as a dragon and what does he immediately do goes down into the crypt and he's just attracted to these dragons, you know? And he almost gets roasted at that point. You know, he wasn't ready for it yet. But I think that he just had to find the oldest dragon, the biggest, most mature one, you know, who would recognize him as someone who speaks Valerian, someone who's like of the right family. And he went for it, but he went for it during the funeral, you know? So yeah, no, like, no, and I, and I get that. Sooner, you know? I get that he did kind of he did kind of he kind of hijacked the situation, but but you get why you get why yeah no you and you definitely get why the more you get to understand his character because he knows his name is not in contention for the throne, his other brother is a fuck up that everyone thinks is a total (laughs) douchebag, and and obviously we're gonna see that play out kind of like what I heard about this character Joffrey from. I hear this character is very similar to Joffrey. So this this uh, the other brother, uh, Eon or whatever his name is, I think it was Aegon and Eron or whatever. But that motherfucker is going to be just, you know, he's just like a drunken. I mean, the whole like last episode, they're looking for him because he like raped yeah. a whore and like, yeah. you know, she got pregnant and they made her like, well, we think they made her get rid of the baby, but I don't think she did. Um, and like, yeah, well, so, see, so I think Aeg- Aegon and the had child Aegon. Uh, gladiator pits, you know, when, and when, the oh my God, that they, scene was so fucking gut wrenching, dude. So vicious. Oh and, and, my and, God. And you see all of the, the bastards of that family. But yeah, but, but, I, but, but I think, I think that Aegon took the dragon because he, he had to, he needed to, he needed to stake a place for himself somewhere, you know, because yeah. He knew he was the superior brother. He knew he was the tougher one. And he wasn't, again, he wasn't in contention. Like, no. outside, of, outside of him actually murdering his brother, you know, what <laughs> else was he supposed to do than have the biggest dragon in the world and give himself a cred amongst the family where it's like, well, okay, well, this guy is definitely the most, like, you know, useful person because because Aeon, Aeon or whatever his name is. We're probably saying these names wrong, but whatever. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> he's, a, he's just a drunken piece of shit that you know yeah. not, not until he, he finally put the crown on and he saw he's all like, those people listen, let me get on a boat and leave yeah and that's like his younger brother all he thinking about do. it like this all is a good idea <laughs> yeah and then, my whores give me some money i'll just get whores and yeah. yeah so everyone to take a quick pause because this is binge drinking it's the first ever podcast uh version of binge drinking where you don't see us drinking i am drinking some uh, white wine, which is hardcore, right? Super hardcore. Johnny Damon, what hardcore. Do you- uh, I got some uh, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, a la Jim Beam. Uh, you're way more hardcore than me. <laughs> so I have to, I have to correct us both uh, right off the bat. It's it's Amond, Amon. Mm. There's there's Aegon and Amond. I think mm. I kept saying Aeon. There's a couple of things that really thematically make this the sequel to the House of Dragons, the sequel to the Game of Thrones. Yeah. Thematically. Uh, yeah, one of them, like we mentioned before, uh, the fact that the dragons are fully realized, fully grown. There's many of them. They start and end the season with the dragons. They really bring it. So thematically- a huge part of the world in this. Absolutely. And so the dragons are a sequel to the, uh, to the original. But in the storytelling and the story writing, 
you and I were just talking about how all of the characters are relatable and and they're there there's really no one like evil yet even damon like he's devious he's really he's he's bad, not a good he's a bad guy he's a bad guy but he's like not evil the he's way that evil. no the way that in the game of thrones you always had the main evil bad guy that was just everyone couldn't wait for their death scene you know and you had all of like the heroic protagonists where you just are so sad when their death scene comes along you know you mentioned joffrey you know but once joffrey's dead you got to have a new horrible bad guy rams you know all these people and so it wasn't really until the very end of the game of thrones where the main people even if they're like bad guys you're rooting for them ha- finally had a battle against each other and it was just so tragic because you you love the people on both sides of the fight you know and the way that house of dragons it just starts out where even though everyone's flawed they're basically like in their own context kind of decent you know and even if they're like otto the strategist like you know he's doing a first oh, even, family oh, even survival, otto you know? i don't i don't consider him evil either he's no, just but he's you know protecting but they his do family like things. everyone is you know he's protecting exactly and so thematically we're starting out in a place where we empathize with both sides of this upcoming civil war and so i feel like it's just going to have a lot more of that tragic drama to it because like there's really no one I'm against right now. Like I really no. like all of the characters. No, that's what makes it so satisfying. God, it, that's why the screenplay is just like ungodly good. You mm-hmm. know, because like there, there's times towards the second half uh mid of the second half of this where Alicent is is going down this antagonist road. But exactly. then, you, but then you understand why, and then it kind of shifts, and it goes towards more like uh, Rhaenyra, and mm-hmm. it's so fucking satisfying because it's not—it's not black and white. There's nobody trying to take over the world for reasons other than good, you know. The, but right. they're all just trying to claim their stake, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. It's like that—that's the coolest thing about this show. It's like, and and again, as you being such you know a Game of Thrones person, you're seeing you're seeing the beginnings of what like later became the aftermath, which is Game of Thrones, of like this civil war created, and, and it's always created from misunderstandings and contrivances. It's never from like one person's good, one person's bad. We have to stop this person. It, it's all just these misunderstandings, you know, or, or just, I think I, you know, ideologies, maybe that's a better way to put it ideologies, but, but I, I, I think it's more about just like family. You have to, you have to make sure your family survives this. And there's no way for both of these families to survive this, which kind of sucks, but. Yeah, you know, you're right about that because, you know, civil wars called brothers wars because it literally is, you know, wars, you know, where brother versus brother, friend versus friend, you know, north versus south, things like that. And that's it comes from personal differences. And in this time of monarchy that we're seeing in in the House of Dragons, the civil war comes from family differences, you know, and it's just so tragic when you see these kids just playing around bullying each other like kids do. But then they grew up and they got dragons. And they're in charge of armies, and it's like thousands of people get drawn into their just kids, you know, hazing each other, and it's it's this mixture of monarchy and civil war, and it's just it's just so interesting, you know. And and again, looking at this, the one of the main differences, big differences that you see from the beginning to end of Game of Thrones versus House of Dragons, Game of Thrones. Visually, the TV show, the writing—it's a man's world. You know, the sex is about the guys. You know, and it's so different from House of Dragons from the beginning to end. This is still a man's world, but the writing, the way the story is told, the audience that it's being told to—this is a story that is about women for women. And you see it with these childhood friends, you know, Rhaenyra and um, Alicent. And they're just sweet, innocent girls. There's nothing bad about them, you know. But they're just drawn into this world where they're suddenly the house, you know, heads of the houses, and now they're just playing this Game of Thrones. And you see them turning into 
people who have a grudge against each other, you know, like frenemies, but it comes from a honest place. I mean, Allison constantly chewing her fingernails down to the nub when she's a kid, you know, she's always bottled up all of this, just all these nerves, you know, and then she just snaps when she goes after Rhaenyra, when her son yeah. loses an eye, you know, because of that yeah. bastard, you but know, and, and it's just a mother's fury. And then the next time we see her, yes, she's repentant. Yes, she's like, how could I lose control? And her dad was like, that's the first time I've seen that you've got what it takes to live, you know. But you <laughs> know, like, and he, coaxes and it out of her. You you talk about how like Game of Thrones is a man's world, and this one kind of shows it from a different perspective. But never did I feel, and I hate this term, woke. But I never felt like it was going down like a woke way like it didn't no, it's not it wasn't like trying to be like hey this is a woman's show now it, not at all not at all it, no. it that's, that's not that's not what it's trying to say it's way too smart for that oh it's, absolutely it's still a male dominated world you have these two female perspectives but you also have the perspective of damon and for a very oh, long yeah. time you had the perspective of venerys yes. oh, it, it, it's so much it's such a personal it's such perfect personal like everything i love about like writing about people and about like what they really think and what they really feel and what they really have to do and if their actions make sense for what they say and what they do on screen like that's what the show is all about like the way the season ended like you have you have Rhaenyra like kind of looking like the one that needs to get her like you know like oh god I need to get revenge but it's like no not really like I, and I'm sure that I'm sure the season's gonna flesh out like what that really means but going back to what you said about the kids and like and like the way the warfare is going to work it's like the you know people that say oh the final episode may not have been epic enough it's like no no, no this this was perfect it's set up like the kids don't understand the severity of this situation like yeah you know uh, uh aegon or whatever the fuck his name is uh, uh amon <laughs> amon is like you know mm -hmm. what? I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bully luke because luke bullied me and he sent mm -hmm. me a pig and now i got the biggest fucking dragon in the fucking world so i'm just gonna <laughs> i'm gonna taunt him but he didn't mm -hmm. understand something about his dragon that his dragon had his own really? beat with this other dragon <laughs> <laughs> That's the first chomp that the dragon's his legs and wings falling to his guy. The first, and he's it, like, it, oops. It's the first time in the show that you realize the dragons don't really have to listen to their riders. No, they don't. They don't. No, they and they really didn't. Don't. They, the, yeah. Dude, uh, Luke's dragon was scared shitless of that. <laughs> and he was small. And for a while, he was able to get away with his advantage of being smaller and faster. But in the end, he just ended up in the mouth of that fucking dragon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my goodness. What a satisfying thing. And you know what? I started YouTubing, like, stories of these, the backstories of different dragons and stuff. And not now, because this is, like, uh, Mysterious is one line where he says that he hopes to usher a second age of dragons. And so, you know, they're still, in what we see, they're still looking back to a time when dragons, because, you know, we're in Westeros. And uh, the main continent is where the dragons and all the albino families are from, you know? And they came out, only one family really came out with dragons to play for Norma had them. And, uh, you know, their ally families followed them out. But there was a first age of dragons. The dragons were everywhere. And so there's stories about this dragon had this personality and this dragon ate that dragon. And there was one dragon that just would eat every dragon and came across, you know? And so, yeah. like, these creatures are intelligent. They understand Valerian. Oh, you know, God. You can yeah. speak to them. And, uh, you know, they can't vocalize. But I think of them as, like, like some kind of uh, ape-like intelligence where chimpanzees and other primates don't have the vocal cords to speak like us. But they can understand us, you know, when we speak to them. Like, they have that little child-like brain, you know, and it's, and it's enough to understand language, even though they can't produce it. And so they actually sometimes try to vocalize. And so you'll see this, you know, I don't think the dragons are trying to vocalize any words, you know, but I think of them as like a horse or a dog or something where, you know, they'll they'll have their own vocalizations and stuff. And and, and anyway, so I'm digressing here, but just the whole thing of like the dragons will eat dragons. And and there's a line where Viserys, where he takes Rhaenyra aside and he first tells her, 
listen, I'm thinking about, I'm going to make you my successor, but you have to show me that you have some depth to your intelligence. And, you know, he asks her, uh, what do you, what do you think when you see the, the dragon? And she says, you know, I, I suppose they're like us, you know, without them, we're just like everyone else, but with them, people call us gods. And, you know, it's because we control the dragons and, and, and her dad seriously says to her, it's an illusion that we control the dragons, <laughs> you know? And I, and I think that we, that we really see that in the end. And, it, and it's so yeah. interesting. I really hope that they bring out a little bit more of the, the untamed dragon aspect later. I'm sure that'll be a subplot. I them. definitely, definitely. I, I definitely think that the final uh, big scene of the final episode was telling us that, I mean, because it was Lady uh, Liana Valerian who had the big dragon that, and he yeah. just, that dragon just loved her. And then yeah. she had that misbirth or whatever it was, oh, God. horrible thing yeah, where it couldn't come out of her way. body. That scene was so epic in so many ways that we won't have so touching. to don't talk the whole thing about. But like, like again, the noise it made, like, like it just didn't want to oh, do yeah. it. Oh, yeah. You don't want to do it, you know? And, and, you, and you understand that, that there's an intelligence there and there's a bonding there. You know, otherwise, they would have eaten this birth a long time ago. <laughs> yeah well and that's the thing like i think it i think the dragons do have a sense of kinship and it, they do have a sense of like loyalty and like how badass are you to ride me which is why like god i want to say Aegon. what the fuck did i say his name was <laughs> yeah whatever yeah the the the, the pirate brother <laughs> yeah, we'll call him the Eyeless. Hey, I'm the Eyeless. That dragon just saw something in that guy. He's like, man, this kid's got some fucking balls, like just yeah. jumping on me. And like, and he was speaking the language. And it's just like, yeah. wow. Right before he got roasted, he said the right words. The dragon was like, okay, I got it. Whatever. Yeah, dude, he, he was sleep. literally <laughs> about to get roasted. Uh, He's about to get roasted. <laughs> Amon, that's it. I keep forgetting. Amon, yeah. There we go. He's a Jamaican. Amon. Amon, the Eyeless <laughs> Man, the Dragon Rider. I want to give I want to give some mad props to uh, Patty Constantine Constantine uh, that played King Viserys. He's he's I've oh. actually seen him in movies and stuff. He's a great actor. God Talk damn. about range. Yeah, he was so good. He was so good. And his character, just like it's interesting to think on a show like this that there was a king that was just trying to always do the right thing and be peaceful. Yeah. And I love it even in his death. They named him Viserys the Peaceful, and it's like oh that's nice. Isn't that the best tribute? I mean, you really feel like these people just want to tear each other apart. And it it just the the most powerful person in the room has to just use their force of personality to just stop everyone from killing each other. I mean, Mysterious is the only reason why, you know, why they weren't killing each other earlier. I mean, the family dinner that he has before his death scene. I mean, what a tragic figure, you know, like you're rooting for him and you know, he's not going to get these kids to make the grandkids to make peace. And, and it's just yeah. like, he, he gave it his, to his last breath, just keep them all together. And then even then, you know, Allison, she's the one who, you know, her dad is coaxing her, Otto's coaxing her, you know, try to train her and she doesn't want to, but then when her son loses his eye, she just goes over the edge and she gets that killer instinct, that tiger mom comes out. And same thing with Rhaenyra. Even after they're like, you know what, we're, usurp we're usurping your throne, we want you to bend the knee, which is basically like, we want you to start the war so we can kill you, you know? There's a game of provocation. And she's like, you know what, I don't want this. I don't want to yeah. do this, that's fine. It's not, and everyone around her is drawing up the battle plans, conscripting, you know, conscripting all their flags, their bannermen and stuff. And she's like, no, until her son is eaten midair. And the look, of just, I mean, it is epic. It, it wasn't an epic battle scene. It was a very, you know, woman in the family room by the fireplace getting the news that her child has just died. And she just goes to the fireplace. You don't even see her dealing with the emotions. She doesn't really make that much sound, but just the way she hunches over and, and you just imagine the drama on her face. And then when she turns and looks in the camera with that cold, steely gaze, it's like, dude, season two, game on. Here we go. You know, like when the peacemakers have turned against each other. And again, for personal reasons, you know, like very deeply, like I love my family reasons, you know, and they're just going to go at it. And it's like, wow, that was dramatic. I mean, that was a hype of drama. I agree. I, I think it ended on a high note, you know. The battlefield scenes of this show were literally when people were sitting around a table 
giving That's each other looks and talking. That scene where everyone is is uh, you know it's Viserys' last dinner, and mm-hmm. you know uh, Allison says like you know I'm sorry, and Rhaenyra says like you know I'm sorry, I I love you. You're one of my friends from my childhood. Like we we have to make this work. All that stuff. Like after you watch the episode, you're like that was all there for Viserys because he was gonna die, and he got to yeah. die kind of. He got to die thinking these happy thoughts, you know, mm-hmm. which is good, which is great. Even though, like, as soon as he dies, and again, like <laughs> for, for the for the last three episodes of the show, the the protagonist and antagonist flip flop so many fucking times. Like when Alicent, you know, has to do that, she has to do this, you know. So you can't blame her, but she has to she has to lie and say like, oh, Viserys, uh, you know, before he died, he said that uh, Aegon should be a uh, prince, and they're like, what? really like well who saw this other than you oh it doesn't matter like i my words the only thing that matters it's like really like that that's that's it's that easy like you know but i think that she misinterpreted what he said i i don't know i have to rewatch that scene well no he did not actually his... say that he never said that. yeah yeah he and was i don't think she ever thought he else. did it, it was Otto telling her to say that that's what i'm saying it's like or she's kind of the antagonist of that episode because she's going so along Otto with it. tells her to say it no no because yeah. she goes to him and says it and he goes that's awesome you know yeah, like but, 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 but that's because that's what she knows he wants her to say he dude uh, mary's uh, never says that he never right. says that. yeah that's why i was like i gotta rewatch that scene because i don't think you know but like i think that he had to say something some way that she could somehow plausibly misinterpret it you know no, I, I think, I think, he was I talking think about... she knew that her family was fucking toast mm. if he didn't do it i mean that's kind of ah. like I said, the whole thing about this show is like the one family can't they can't concede to the throne because then they know they'll be murdered even if that's mm. not true they think they'll be murdered you know and yeah. it's like the weirdest scene for me was uh uh, uh oh god what's her name uh Rhaenyra's or whatever, like uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Prince, the Prince, Queen, who never was. Oh my God! When she comes up out of the ground, <laughs> King's Landing at the coronation, like, and everybody thinks that's so badass. But I'm like, she just murdered like tons and tons and tons of innocent women and children just to yeah. show her dominance. They were herded in there by the King's Guard to watch something. Yeah, but o- no only no to one told say, him. <laughs> but only to say that she has no place in this war. So I didn't yeah. understand why she did that at all i have no she idea she just had to break out of prison she she was she was uh broke out of in prison. prison they would have done her in if Dude, she had uh, are you not saying declared. she couldn't have taken that dragon out a different way where she didn't have to just like nuclear bomb that room and kill all those i don't people? know i would have to study the architecture of that building but yeah there's probably a different way there's probably a different way she could have got out because that's not how the dragons get out normally <laughs> yeah, my, my point. So yeah, that, like, that was why dramatic, did, why, but it doesn't make sense in hindsight, does it? it it's <laughs> the only weak point of the writing for me is I I don't understand why they had her go that direction. Yeah, go you that said, way. Like, like you're like, hey, I, should, I should have. Uh, you, like you said, I, I'd have to study the architecture. It's like you and I shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> if, if she wasn't a bad person, she wouldn't have killed all those people. And Fair if enough. she was, if she was breaking out to prove a point. She would have fried. Yeah, she would have roasted everyone. You're right. That is the one, that moment, that was something they just did for the visual effect, I think, and not no, I, really yeah, for tight storytelling. That. But, but that's weak. Yeah. That's, but that's it a, is that's, weak. That's, that's, that's my that's, one that weak thing. That's my one I'm week. going to write a strongly worded podcast on the subject. I'm just saying that's the one kind of weak thing. I right agree now. with you. I, I don't I don't understand the characters' motivations where as you and I have been blowing this show for an hour, we love it. That's true. I, I love sucking some Game of Thrones dick. I did not understand why she did that. That's all. Other than no, that, and, and you know what? You're right about that. Because it shows that you can have some flaws. And you know, there may other be there may be some other flaws, but I am myself at that moment, mm-hmm. I was like, Hold on, this doesn't seem plausible the way that it panned out. But I didn't pick up on the part of why did she escape that way. I was like, this is implausible at the part where like she doesn't roast everyone on the dais on the coronation dais. You it know? doesn't make any like, sense. It yeah, doesn't make sense not? at all. You ended that's... the war. If you do that, you end the war. Well, it's not my war. That's up between yeah, you guys. Yeah, not my war. <laughs> well, then, aside from all the people you just murdered with your dragon, now you're gonna have a lot of other people's deaths on your hands because now there's gonna be a civil war that you could have stopped. Yeah, you could have yeah. stopped it right then and there. But I think that what we're getting at, possibly, this is the most probable thing. These people are just callous nobles. 
they well, really no, I think don't you're right. care I think about you're right. anyone I think around the them. Point was that I think <laughs> I think you're right. The point was that she is a princess, and she's like, I don't care about these people. Like that's yeah, fuck the people. And I think she's the nice one. <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're right, though. Kind of the point is like it's like these people are just fodder. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, even though, like, as a viewer for me, because I don't know Game of Thrones, I know there's vicious, horrible shit that goes on in Game of Thrones where people are just yeah. fucking executing each other. So for me, up until this point, I hadn't seen like a big figurehead like this do something to just a group of innocent people before. So it was a it was a cool visual and it was definitely a cool scene with the dragon popping up. But yeah, it was weak writing. Yeah, I just remember going like, why? Why is she doing this? Why not just leave? Like, you got your dragon yeah. house go <laughs> like, I, th I think maybe when they were like writing this up that was just one of those compromises They're like you know what okay whatever let's just take this decision let's move on to the next you know like i think that, that could have been uh redone later but it's it's almost like the rest of the series wouldn't happen if they hadn't been they could have they could have put a different dramatic ending right there you know like oh, you're, you're right twist. though you're right you're right though so let's go to um our mvps uh let's go to mvps of who, characters who yeah who stood out to you the most this year you know what i really want to talk about what i haven't talked about yet is king viserys targaryen oh i mean God. he is like the character you know so uh viserys targaryen patty considine um what range you know like we're, we're talking about age progression with the different characters this guy has disease progression this guy has the flesh killing or flesh eating i don't know what it is you know basically his body is dying piece by piece over years you know um i think someone looked it up it was something like necropulence or something like that where just your body just dies you know and so he is literally the only character keeping the peace and as his body rots and decays the peace is rotting and decaying you know he is a metaphor for the dying piece of this golden age uh that's just basically good about to get roasted by dragons you know you're going to see entire cities just turn to cinder i mean in the in the game of thrones there's places where like the dragons just burnt out towns and all there are just ruins you know and now these are thriving places with you know and so it's like targaryen viserys targaryen is the one person only together talk about the trifecta they've got the writing for the character which is great the actor has the range for age because he's progressing in age but also for the disability you know because he's losing limbs and at the same time the cgi you know the he he actually looks like he's decaying in front of your eyes you know and and so it's just such a well-created character from the actor through the writing the cgi and everything together and i really feel like he's the main character of this whole season even though he doesn't i mean he's got a lot of screen time and he's absent a lot in the end but he's still the most powerful person even if he's never ever in the room you know i just, i just love his performance and everything about the character yeah the whole st well the whole story is based around him because that's what that's what the conflict is about is about who is he calling his successor you know like that's the thing and he he's always very clear about it he he never mixes words that's what i love about him he's absent for like one episode and then when you see him again and he's finally like his eye oh. is gone and he's deteriorated and he's oh, having trouble. so well done oh it was so good it's just gut wrenching oh, hobbling along i mean but, that's the thing is that you forget that it's fake when he's trying like he's like i will present myself in public not horrify people i will walk and sit on my throne i will pass judgment and like you're just like like you said gut-wrenching just rude like i wanted to walk into my tv screen and hold his arm and help this noble man up to his throne and he would say yeah. no you know and i think you told me that the part where his crown falls off and damon just like picks it up and just brings it and and just you have this moment of compassion you yeah, know, that and Matt, that was Matt Smith. Uh, that was Matt Smith. Uh, improv. That scene, yeah, yeah. So good, you know, like, like they're I, of the caliber I, I think where they he can would do that, or stuff. he should do that. And I'm like, God, ah, that's the great. right thing in the moment.
classically <laughs> when you get a lot of classically trained like british actors you get these nuances obviously matt smith but, damon oh my god yeah i gotta give a lot of i gotta give a lot of credit the, to my girl olivia cook who played the older version of allison i i've watched her career for years she's fucking fantastic and I didn't even know she was British until this show because she plays Americans in almost everything she's ever done. And until I saw this show and I saw her doing interviews, I had no idea she was British <laughs> and she's so fucking good. And then, you know, I, I love the, uh, the, the girl that played, um, uh, Millie Alcott that played Renera as a young kid was so like vulnerable and interesting and, and and you know obviously very pretty but that's not it's it's more about just like and and i loved her as an adult too but i i kind of loved her character as a youngster like kind of discovering things that are going on and that fourth episode where she has this kind of weird sexual thing with her uncle it was that must have been a really hard thing to do and it was just kind of i don't know it just like even though it was hard to watch and it was kind of disturbing in a very sexual way it's just like oh my god like this this scene it's just like i don't know what's going on it's i don't know for some reason it just like worked for me and everybody was so so invested into into that scene you know i know it was a weird scene and, and uh emma darcy that plays uh Rhaenyra as an adult is fucking amazing as well i just didn't see this you know the writing is you know you everybody has their own things on what they love about the writing and stuff like that. But those <laughs> scenes work for me. And I think, I, every, I, really, I think everybody works for me in the show. There's no weak link. Even the guy, even the fucking douchebag, uh, who's the douchebag fucking the guy, the, the King's guard that was like, that ended up having sex with Renera. Kristen Cole. Kristen Cole. Is <laughs> such a, he's turned into such a fucking scumbag. <laughs> uh, uh, nobody's yeah, he's good. You know, um, but I, I really do want to double back on what you were saying about Rhaenyra. What a compelling, I mean, the young Rhaenyra versus the older one, which is, yeah. you know, she's a very important role, but you're right about that. Now that I think about it, the first like few, like first half of the episodes, when, when it was the younger Rhaenyra, she really, really delivered. I mean, yeah. that character is the driving force, you know, like her, do I want to be with this guy or that guy, you know, like this and that, you know. Um, and just everybody trying to, will she be the successor or not? But not just with like strategy of like secession, but just every scene she's in, she's in so many scenes. And as an actress, you know, really, really, really brings that performance out. It, there, it's, it's, I'm, I don't even know how young she is, but I was she's like, a, she's a 20 year old actress that if you remember back when you were 20, and someone said, hey, you have to pretend like you're sleeping with your uncle. <laughs> She's a 20 year old actress, which to me is just basically like a child, you know, so it's like, exactly, she, yeah, you really understood the role. And like, you know, the, like this, this character, like you said, coming of age, you know, like, like the, the canary leaving the cage. I think they even they may have made that metaphor where where Damon is like, OK, I'm going to show you the real world. You know, this is what's out there. And, um, you know, that was just such a really convincing performance. I feel like it's almost like an episode of Euphoria or something where it's like, you know, there's kind of all the TV drama. Like, I know we had our times you know, <laughs> back in the day yeah. and my oldest friend, you know, and it's interesting to see it like almost like I never went to a rave like that one. But uh, yeah, I didn't but, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I know. And to see a person just coming of age in that world. That's what I love about shows like this, where the, the people are human. You can relate to them on a human level, but the setting is different. You know, it's a world where there's dragons and it's a, you know, Renaissance style monarch, this is whatever, you know, and it's like, I don't live in that world, but because these are actual real people, I'm like, oh, this is how I would be in that situation. And that's what, um, and, and I don't want to go negative, but uh, that's what makes Game of Thrones so much better than something like the Rings of Power where it's just forced i mean you can spend all the money you want on earth you can have the most beautiful costumes and setting you know hire the the most uh perfect looking for the role you know talent but if you just don't have the writing and you don't have the acting it's all for nothing 
And yet, you know, House of Dragons, they bring it. They always bring it. It's better than ever. And it could be so much worse if they just didn't have the right casting and the right writing, you know, and it really comes to that. I mean, all the special effects and costumes on Earth can't cover a bad script. Well said, man. Like, oh, my God, you just took the words right out of my mouth, especially like when it comes. I, I made this argument a long time ago for X-Men 1 and X-Men 2 that came out in 2000 and 2003 when people were like, oh, it just wasn't that exciting. My thing was, I said, the script came first. The script came first. Uh, That's action, the most important part. Action scenes are secondary. Tell me you didn't love the characters and you didn't love where they were going and what they were doing. That matters so much more than a spectacle action scene. And it proved to be right because a lot of these other, you know, comic book movies that want to have these huge special effects extravaganza scenes they lack in that character thing because they're not paying attention to their script and they're not caring about who's involved and why somebody should care. And that's what this show does. It makes you care about the people. I mean, God, the show just wouldn't work otherwise. Like, uh, I'm totally hooked. Uh, 100%. I can't not, wait for season two. I can't fucking wait. I hope it doesn't take two years. Give it, it to, might, though. Give it, it, to might. Us it might not be yeah, until but if 2024. They're smart, though, they should give it to us next Christmas. That's really what they should do. But J.R. Martin Bastard Sword Productions was saying that, like, the next uh, season, it's just so much bigger. It's on such a larger yeah. scale. Yeah. So many more locations. And the families that we know from the uh, Game of Thrones, the Starks, the Lannisters, etc., you know, you see those families fleshed out, more characters, more places. And he was like, you know what? We're not going to get it out in 2023. I have a lot to say about it, and I hope I expressed my feelings on it because I, I think it's kind of a masterpiece of storytelling when it comes to, you know, I don't care if something's TV. I hate when people compare, oh, it's good for TV. It's like, no, TV is just as good, if not better these days than film. House of the Dragon, it wants to stay true to, like, Game of Thrones, so it's week by week. And, God, it made me just wait for it every Sunday. Ugh, I just and, – and every Sunday, it just it just rocked. I just love It's it. so worth the wait. It does stand out because, like you said, now, you know, uh, people drop multiple episodes at a time. Like, like you said, and I, and I think you were right about that. Like, Netflix really did start – we're just going to give the whole season. You know, like, Netflix started binge-watching. And now it's almost rare to find something that you're willing to wait for. Like, I am willing to wait. Like, I will be there as soon as it drops. I am, like, ready to watch this thing. And it's just, it, you know, comes back to the craft and stuff. I want to thank Mr. Johnny Diamond for coming on and uh, talking about House of Dragons for the first binge drinking episode that is a podcast, which is not visual. So thank you so much, sir. And uh, I hope you are a regular on the uh, Bench Drinking Podcast. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. This is perfect format for me. I'd love to do some more podcasts. House of the Dragon is fucking incredible. Everyone should go out and watch it now. <sighs> Season two, you know, we'll just have to anticipate it. And hopefully uh, it comes out sooner than later. But I want them to take their time with it. It deserves it. It's going to be a way. It's probably going to be a higher budgeted season with more crazy shit going on. But I don't want them to lose the uh, the personal aspect of it, because that's the thing that drives this show so far. You know, that's for, what's made this this so much different. It is epic on a small scale, a very it's small personal scale. drama epic. It's so relatable. And yet you're you're in a different world. I mean, I'm I'm just so into it. And you know what? I would love the big action stuff, but like you said, all the big battlefields, battle scenes happened around the table, and, and it's just, just so satisfying. Can't wait for the next season. Me too. All right, thanks, guys. Please, if you're watching this, click like, subscribe. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Until next time, we drink your cinema. Ah, ba -ba -ba! <laughs>